So welcome back to the Security Token Insiders interview series. This is, my name is Kyle Sondland. I'm the host of the, the show here, and I'm joined with Kyle Fry from Digital Markets. I'm really excited to have you on today. It's good to be here. So we're excited. We're going to be talking about security tokens. This, this interview series presented by Security Token Market in, in partnership with Redblock. And we're really excited to dive into it today because I know that digital markets has been very active in the security token industry. And we've had a, a pretty solid relationship working on bringing some of these deals to market. So could you briefly give us a little breakdown of, of your company and what you guys have been doing in the space? Yeah, sure. So we've been we've been sort of building, um, you know, for several years now, uh, really focused on digital securities, obviously, uh, always had our eye on what's going on in crypto and, you know, kind of seeing the, the trends of the convergence, but really kind of focused on the regulated market, um, trying to as best as possible shrink and, and if not sever and eradicate the the, the um, connection between issuers and investors and really bringing them much closer together. Um, entirely focused on blockchain, blockchain and, and digital securities technologies. Obviously, we've seen a lot of changes there as well. But generally speaking, um, you know, most of our time these days is really kind of focused on the final piece, which is trading uh, IPOs in, in secondary liquidity with respect to digital securities, but our eye is absolutely on the prize of making it as, as accessible as possible for two founders in a garage to do cap table management or tokenize a lot of these things that we think have, are generally a commodity over time. Uh, but today, mostly focused around getting more volume, getting more trading, and really focused on, on that piece of it, but eventually kind of moving further away towards the private fundraising and cap table management and tokenization for founders today. And among other things that I won't uh, bore you with on, on the roadmap, because it's hard not to, to touch a lot of things, but our priority really is around uh, secondary liquidity, because you know, as, as you and I have discussed in the past, this idea of blockchain and digital securities is really meant to provide liquidity. I mean, that's literally it. It's, it's this ability for people to buy and sell on the back end. So we're starting from the end game and really focusing on that and getting trading and providing the, the, the problems and solutions with on-ramps and fundraising. And then eventually we'll move backwards towards the more earlier stage stuff uh, because that's obviously ultimately the dream for two founders eventually is to provide their investors with liquidity. Right. That's an interesting focus. I think we've seen a lot of players in the space trying to focus on that origination in the primary side. And so I do think it's fascinating and, and a cool aspect that you're focused more on the secondary trading, that liquidity piece that's just so crucial and, and does seem to, to still be building its way into the markets. Um, so let's start it off. Let's take a step back and, and let's talk about how, you know, how do you see blockchain really transforming the, the traditional financial system? Where, where are the biggest improvement opportunities here? And, and why is this such an important piece of, of, of the capital markets that we can upgrade? Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting because there's uh, there's a few different lenses I think you need to look at to to really see uh, the full on benefits. I think, you know, as as blockchain was coming out, um, I think probably most people and still a lot of folks today, frankly, see blockchain and sort of smart contracts being this programmatic uh, compliance, which will allow for you know the private markets to really have liquidity. Um, and that really being uh, the main focus. So you tokenize, you fundraise, you're doing a private placement, you you digitize, and that'll just make it easier to move things around. Um, that is absolutely massive. I mean, when you think about like real estate and all sorts of these huge, um, you know, asset classes that are that are pretty illiquid, and moving them more to liquidity, I think blockchain is a, a huge, almost a requirement to sort of get this world moving, given you know, removing a lot of the costs, but really programming, um, you know, the compliance and the smart contract side. So I sort of see that as on the private side, the blockchain on sort of the more public side. So, you know, for example, what Paxos is doing, I think they have a no action letter to be able to do clearing and settle and trading for public securities is really interesting to drive down costs. Uh, obviously, DTCC has spent uh, a lot of time looking into these markets as well, but probably, you know, on the, a private markets, it looking like a much bigger sort of overhaul and change. I think on the on the public markets, it driving down 
some of the costs. Um, and we'll talk about some of those, I, I think a bit, bit later as well in terms of, you know, does blockchain really help on the public side today? I think the, the, the actual benefits are lower than in the private context, um, but I do think there are interesting benefits for blockchain on the public side as well that investors will see benefits to. And especially as we get more exchanges launching this ability to cross list and self custody and move it onto other exchanges is really the benefit on, on the digital security and blockchain side. Interesting. And, and maybe a, a hot topic that, that we've talked about before and, and is something that I think most of the public is always asking about. And let's talk about regulation. And is this stuff legal? How are we working with this? And, and, and what are the different pieces here that you need to keep in mind when you're talking about a security token offering? Yeah, so I think, you know, when you, I know when you and I always talk, and well, this is, so our view of the world is we spend all of our time outside the United States. Like I'm an American, uh, JW, my partner is, is Canadian. We know the North American market extremely well. I've spent way too many hours reading reggae papers and SEC documents, and it's so hard not to get honestly sucked into all of the rhetoric around regulation in the United States. And, you know, traditionally, I think a lot of regulatory bodies have really kind of watched the United States and either followed them or just generally been aware of how they're thinking about describing things. But I think very important to sort of draw a pretty uh, pretty heavy, stark line between the United States and everywhere else in the world. Um, I think on the regulation side, a lot of the stuff that's even happening in the traditional markets is all extremely positive. You know, this this all these exemptions that are allowing for, you know, more retail investors in this really retail led. Uh, revolution, you know, and, and, and restrictions. I think there's a, a lot of positive things. I would say generally very high tailwinds. Now there's going to be bumps in the road. You hear things come in and out where, where it seems it might even be negative against Bitcoin or, you know, things generally going on in the space. But I think these are just generally growing pains for them to understand. I think um, fundamentally, when they can grasp the notion that you can program compliance and really be proactive about regulation with respect to securities laws, that that's a powerful tool versus being much more reactive. And so, you know, there's a lot of super positive trends, but I think it's hard. I mean, the incumbents in terms of the financial institutions and a lot of the money and the governments slowly perhaps or look at this as a way they're going to lose control and lose power, whereas hopefully it actually just allows them to be more um, um, more optimal in terms of their ability to do things and track things and watch things and hold people accountable for things. So uh, on the private side, lots of huge things. I think, you know, it's this sort of um, convergence of a spectrum between NASDAQ and the public markets and this super liquid stuff at VC that sits there for seven to 10 years. We're slowly bringing these together to be a much shorter line in terms of uh, what re regulation provides. And, you know, I think I'm pretty bullish. And what's interesting and, and something our team's actually looking into is blockchain in many of the main regulatory bodies that a lot of issuers and investors come from isn't totally recognized by being by acknowledged as the actual ownership for the share. So if you own the token, that doesn't mean because your name's on the blockchain that you're the owner of that share from a regulatory body perspective. And so the you know, US, for example, wants transfer agents and a ton of stuff to actually be um, to, to have the actual record of who owns that share. And just because you own the token doesn't mean you own the share. I think people are using it as as a reflection of ownership today, but we're not quite at the digitally native. Now, um, you know, you know, we work mm. very closely with the merge team and the Seychelles, Seychelles, Seychelles regulatory body actually does acknowledge blockchain token ownership on the blockchain as a digitally native ownership of the share. So they're not gonna be the only ones. There's probably a wide spectrum. This is something we're looking into because I think that tends to show how progressive regulatory bodies are. And I do think, you know, just like in crypto days, when you saw Bermuda come out and Malta come out and all these, these uh, smaller jurisdictions using blockchain and technology to sort of figure out what way to, how do I leapfrog and become competitive um, in this sort of new world where, you know, things are more liquid and how do I be a bit more progressive with this new technology coming out from a regulatory perspective, but net net, I think super positive.
Right. I think that that's fascinating, especially with how the world right now, we're trying to build this global financial system. And the cool thing about security tokens is that traditionally with the securities markets, it was very fractionalized. It's pretty fragmented based off of the different jurisdiction that you know the, the security was hosted in, right? And, and, and was yeah. fundraised through. And, and now with the security token industry, we're really trying to build those compliance standards that can be used across all these different jurisdictions that allows for kind of one regulatory climate for securities. And as long as everyone is kind of following that same level of standard, which in a lot of cases happens to be that the US's highest level of, of, of standards on that front. But as long as we can adopt those those rules and regulations, it seems like everyone in the world is, is kind of able to play ball in that way, which is, is something that's pretty revolutionary. Yeah, no, that, that that's that's perfect that you said that because that's that's the dream, right? Is that you know you sort of got KYC ML. Can we come up with a global standard so people aren't doing it all the time? You know, you use your passport once. I think obviously the securitized team is is looking to try to uh, build into that piece. And then there's um, you know let's prevent fraud. Everyone's trying to prevent fraud. I don't care what regulatory body you are. There are uh, frameworks such as IOSCO, which you know the SEC is part of. And you know, UK and FCA and a lot of the other large, they're 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 part of these regulatory bodies that have global standards. And then there's the the final piece, particularly on the exchange and the public side, which is transparency. Do investors have enough information at the right time? Right? How do you communicate this stuff uh, to actually make a decision? Not just on the offering, but this is this ongoing reporting stuff, like 10Ks, 10Qs, mm-hmm. um, in in the United States. Interesting. And, and so maybe that kind and that's of segment. Where, that's, I was just going to say, that's where most people have the brain damage, right? Is do <laughs> I have to get a lawyer in every jurisdiction? How do I solicit investors in every jurisdiction? And the answer is, it depends. Oh, <laughs> it's <gosh>. gray. <laughs> Uh, and no one knows. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like I feel like that the answer tends to be if you take the highest level of precaution, it should apply yeah. everywhere as opposed to yeah. you know trying to if you try to, to fit every rule and regulation, it might be tougher than if you just take the highest level of compliance and kind of apply that to everyone, then maybe you're in a better situation. But definitely right. you're gonna need lawyers for that. And uh, that's kind of an interesting idea, right? Of, of having global securities lawyers as opposed to ones that are specifically focused on a jurisdiction. You'll start to see some of these, these firms that will be focused specifically on these kinds of problems that are going to become more and more relevant in the coming years. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. So moving into technology, you talked about it a little bit, blockchain-based registries. I think this is something interesting. We've seen here in the US, they still don't necessarily allow for the blockchain to represent the primary ledger of, of these transactions, which you mentioned before. How, you know, let's talk a little bit about the technology and how that's applied potentially in some of these secondary market solutions. Is it really just kind of a patchwork thing at this point? Are we headed towards something that's better than that? Or, or is it kind of bleak? What, what, what are your thoughts on, on the space so far? Yeah, I think I think techno- the word technology to me is much broader than just the blockchain for sure. I think, you know, the blockchain has kind of started this whole thing and the notion that it's the reflection of who owns something that can be seen by other people on some sort of public or slightly public um, semi-private ledger, depending on. But, you know, on, on blockchains, we've seen, you know, Ethereum be the one and only place to go. And I think over time, it's it's interesting because um, a security launching on a blockchain is a very different conversation than a crypto launching on a blockchain. It's different considerations because uh, you know crypto needs to be secure, and you know if you don't hold the keys, you don't have your your crypto sort of thing. And uh, you know by their very nature, securities are somewhat centralized, and you know by the issuer and by regulatory bodies, and so things can be burned uh, burned and reissued even if the token does reflect the digitally native ownership of those shares. It's probably going to always be duly tracked by the issuer as well as the investor sitting on the share or the exchanges or the trading platform. Um, you know, ERC and its gas fees have made it super challenging for investors to, to move their shares around and hasn't really been a great solution. I think there's a lot of great blockchains out, out there, uh, you know, Algorand, NIM, symbol with their launch and you know there, there's there's several others and i think it's really just like transaction speed and you know basic bare simple stuff um it's different than sort of launching a utility token and wanting the network effects of being on ethereum it's just it's a different sort of concept thinking about security tokens so 
I think what if they can bring, uh, if if a blockchain can bring transaction speed and security and you know smart contracts being a very important element, and then you start getting the NFTs and other other things we can do, and how do we build momentum? That's one element, and I think there's a lot of great blockchains out there being very competitive in the space. But when I think about technology, I also just think about interoperability. I think as we plug in, you know, you talk about a KYC standard or you talk about, um, you know, uh, ways to plug in and fund or UI UX and being able to do things on the mobile phone and just how interconnected these all, all these things need to be when you're trying to connect an issuer to an exchange. The technology behind that requires APIs and integration. So there's a lot more happening beyond just blockchains. When people think about technology, they think is going to be this layer. And, and you know, we we should definitely talk about uh, the trends on investors and issuers and what they're seeing and what will drive adoption. But technology is sort of blockchain. And then there's other this other layer of technology, which is UI UX. It's integrations. It's seamless. Um, stepping through this so that everyone can do things mobily and KYC interconnects and then you can use KYC to passport into other jurisdictions. And, you know, so again, it's more than blockchain and it's all these things building, but there's a lot of work happening there as well. That's interesting. And I wanted to pinpoint one thing you said there that I think is, is very true. And that's just the reality that the blockchain technology itself doesn't actually matter quite as much for security tokens as it does in the traditional crypto industries. Because I think part of the reason why is because of those protections that we are, whether it's intentional or, or accidental, forced by regulators to manage these kind of you know ledgers on paper, right? Because of the fact that blockchain isn't the end all be all record here. And because of the fact that with securities, you do need the ability of rewinding transactions and, and specifically managing shares on the behalf of shareholders and having agency over those shares. There's a whole lot less importance of this permanence and the immutability of the blockchain, which is that one piece that I think everybody really you know hits on hard when they talk about the benefits of blockchain. You know, really for security tokens, it seems that the true benefits of the blockchain technology is really just in a lot of the automation of some of these information, right, of the, the KYC and identification information, having that as a verifiable, immutable source, and then being able to make actions based off of it. But the actual custody itself doesn't necessarily need that, that blockchain. And in some cases, as you're mentioning, it actually can, can have an adverse effect because of the fact that we need these high transaction volumes and we need this ability to transfer a ton of value on chain. And a lot of blockchains aren't equipped to handle that yet. Yeah, no, I think that's perfect. You highlighted that because I, I think a lot of people focus on this idea of like peer to peer where I'm going to just send you securities and there's no one else around to notice. And now you own that share basically like crypto in terms of who owns the keys, owns the crypto. Securities now, now if you start looking at securities where someone's not tracking the ledger on another side, whether it's a CSD or DTC or CDS or transfer agent or some service provider and or the issuer itself, knowing when these things transfer, I think that's where, you know, and, and talk, alluded to this a little bit that blockchain in the private context being more important because of smart contracts and the ability to, you know, program in compliance versus if you list on a on a public exchange, they sort of just sit like at merge. You would sit in their CSD, and there's one line item in your cap table called merge nominee, and it doesn't have all of them. It just literally sits there. So the digital element of it not being as relevant when you're public until you start cross listing on multiple exchanges. But in this world that I think a lot of folks are building, this idea behind peer-to-peer -peer trading, you know, you still need a transfer agent or someone to really kind of be monitoring these things moving, notwithstanding the fact that regulation doesn't acknowledge that who owns the shares uh, has actual ownership of their shares. So a lot of focus there. The, the one point I'd make um, before I uh, hand it back to you, Kyle, is, you know, when people talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, in my view, you know, crypto is really made to be peer-to-peer. When you think about the original Satoshi white paper, and it's literally talking about this peer to peer cash mechanism, and you look at where all the volume and where everybody trades, they trade on Coinbase or Binance, they trade literally on exchanges. So I think the fact that crypto is, is peer to peer and meant to be peer to peer and simplified from that standpoint, not regulated, where it's easier flow, all of these things trade on exchanges. And now we're trying to apply this peer to peer model 
almost too much. Look, let's not talk 10 years down the line because who knows? I'm talking now the next couple of years because this world's going to be in transition before we get to this ideal state where technology tracks with regulation, all these things. This idea that peer-to-peer -peer is going to be the start of securities, I just, I don't quite, I'm just not there. Uh, I think there's a there's a model that if you're a private security token and you don't want to go public and you don't want to deal with being on a public exchange and reporting and you're private, net net ATSs and MTFs will facilitate trading um, that you couldn't normally do. So I'd say there's probably three stages to the technology. One, you digitize, put it on the blockchain, and you've got an issuer who can facilitate transfers. That's legal today. Kyle, you want to get out of my shares you bought three years ago because you need to pay for um, your, your new sick penthouse apartment in Miami, um, you know, you ask me and you say, hey, can you get someone else to buy the shares? I go out to the other shareholders. I say, anyone want to buy these? We could facilitate that through a platform. You could facilitate that on the blockchain. That's step one. Step two is that starts to happen a lot. I probably want to start thinking about getting my, my shares quoted on, especially in the United States, an ATS, but I, I, I don't want to quite deal with being a public company. So I'm not going to list on an exchange then smart contracts and ATSs start to facilitate that trading liquidity. And then there's the third piece where, you know, let's just list on a full blown exchange, which is where we're focused kind of driving down that not everyone has to go to the NASDAQ. There are steps before that, before leading to your sort of NASDAQ unicorn uh, IPO to, to do. So, you know, starting all the way at the beginning, that's where a lot of the technology comes in. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more that the peer to peer model just seems really tough. I, you know, the benefit of, of an exchange is, is that liquidity piece, right? In terms of having a, a deep book of, of, you know, an order book for, 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 the, for that, the lack of a better term. In some cases, we can't have that with marketplaces and some of these ATSs, but, but really having a, a deep network of investors is really where that provides the price transparency that you actually need if you're going to be trading these underlying assets. Peer-to-peer -peer just doesn't really work that way. Um, and and that, that doesn't seem like a productive method of, of asset management when you're talking about, you know, millions or billions of dollars of assets. So, yeah. And look, I, I, the, the one last thing I could say is, is DEXs, right? Decentralized exchanges, like this idea, like, again, I love it. It's just how, how do we get there? And when is that? Is that 10 years, five years? Love the idea. And again, at the end of the day, we're literally just trying to connect issuers and investors. So the more we can move in between the better, but with the folks that are trying to do that today, we're not there yet. The world's not there. Regulation, technology, UI, adoption, et cetera, is just not there. So love, again, the idea of DEXs and decentralized exchanges, but not, we're just not quite there. So that's a, that's a good point. And maybe the, the last and final piece that we can talk about here on, on the, the interview um, is talking about issuers and investors. And so with liquidity and with, with these projects, you need these investors to actually be able to, to fund these projects and, and start trading these assets. And I think it does in a lot of ways come down to having high quality assets on, you know, on an exchange available to invest, right? If people aren't making money, then they're not going to be interested in the industry. And we've seen that in crypto. And so what, what kinds of issuers are, should we be striving to build in this industry? And should we be looking for to, to come to market and to bring to market that are going to help drive traction of the industry? Yeah, it's a, it's really a chicken and egg, right? Um, in terms of <laughs> which one needs to come first. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, you look at what ICOs did, right? I mean, as, as much as that gave the entire industry a bad name, proof point raising $35 million in 10 minutes is insane. There's demand, the technology's there. And there's a world of like raising global uh, capital from global investors is there, it literally exists. So how do we now map it back to a framework of, of regulatory? Um, you know, crypto again has done a great job, ICOs and then, and then crypto in terms of even just currencies and people getting used to it and understanding there's this world outside the traditional system. You know, we're so, I think crypto's done a great job in, in pushing the importance of blockchain and going global and these things and it's done a great job. And then, you know, what, what you guys just put on um, uh, security token markets, which was brilliant, is tokenized stocks. Again, another step in the evolution of there's demand for this stuff. Now, let's just provide access to people. So, you know, it's, it's, it's bringing 
um, really cool issuers and, and investment opportunities to people that are literally begging for it from the ICO boom to the crypto boom to the tokenized stock boom of stuff they just do not have access to. And so, you know, what does that what does that take? What does that mean? So now doing it in the regulatory front, it's obviously going to be slower than crypto. That's why digital securities and security tokens have not taken off anywhere near at the pace that it has um, for crypto, but you and I both know it's 100x the size plus, right? It's trillions and trillions of dollars and quadrillions um, in, in terms of size. And so, you know, figuring out that that piece of putting on high quality uh, uh, issuers and saying, look, don't be scared of digital. And by the way, if you're an issuer, you can digitize and it's it's maybe relevant to half your investors and the other don't really care because it could just sit in your wallet the treasury wallet of you issuer and, and they don't have to deal with wallets or any of that stuff. You can walk them through how to do it and you could facilitate that directly with an exchange or a trading platform where investor, the ones that are, you know, maybe still using fax machines that want to invest in your company don't want to deal with, with wallets. You can, you can sort of do both. That's kind of the beauty of the world a bit, but investors, you know, um, they need access. They need it. And they want it to be simple. On the mobile phone, clicking a few buttons, Robinhood, Betterment, Wealth Simple, all brilliant of examples of folks making it super easy for folks to invest in stuff they didn't have access to do. And you start marrying that with the regulation, you're getting new companies that nobody could ever invest for before uh, that's allowing for all this. And, and on the issuer side, it's how do you lower my cost of capital? And how do you lower the amount of time I spend doing it? Because I'd rather run my business then deal with raising, whether it's VC, whether it's friends and families, whether it's going public, I don't wanna deal with it as least amount of time as possible. I think a lot of people sort of fall in love a little bit with going and talking to VCs for 90 days when <laughs> it's good, it's, it's good practice to articulate your story, but generally speaking, how do I raise money fast and how do I keep it as least amount of administrative burden on my company as possible? And those are the things we're trying to solve. Cool. Cool. That's fantastic. If you wanted to give just a little bit of a, you know, one minute pitch on what, what you guys are up to, what you're looking for in terms of clients or anybody that's listening that, that might want to work with you, we, that might be appreciated as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. I think, you know, for us, we're again, really focused on, um, you know, IPOs and sort of the secondary market trading and, and really getting issuers that are ready to sort of either raise, you know, have traction, want to raise a, a good amount of capital, and IPO and, and also provide that secondary liquidity trading immediately upon those the, the offering. Um, so, you know, marketplaces, I think this makes a lot, lot of interesting perspectives too. Um, there's a lot of primary platforms in the world and you mentioned earlier, and there, there isn't a ton of options in the secondary trading markets, which we provide. So we can actually plug right into a primary offering platform. Now, the only thing I'd say, the caveat is, we don't deal or touch offerings in the United States. There's enough amazing platforms that do that, that we partner with uh, that do that substantially better than we ever will. But we can provide a solution where they can sort of just plug into secondary trading from a reporting spec perspective, diligence perspective, strategy, and, and provide really a, a step-in solution for issuers on that side. Cool. So how do they find you? How do they get more information? digital.co d-i-g-t-l dot c-o cool great well thanks kyle really appreciate it we uh this is a great conversation we may have to do another one because of, i feel like there's so much meat left on the bone here <laughs> well uh thanks for having me on i i, I gotta say i i listen I, I check security token markets about every other day and uh i i listen to the podcast uh, it's partly part of my my weekly uh, my weekly deep dive into the sector. So appreciate <laughs> all the stuff you guys do for the industry. Of course. So if you're listening or you're watching this, definitely check out Digital Market. Subscribe. Leave a comment below. Anybody else that you want to have us uh, interview next? Thanks again to Redblock. They're going to be transcribing this into Chinese, syndicating that out to an Asian audience as well, so we can include everybody in this global movement. It's not just focused here on the US, North America, and Europe. So trying to really build a global system here. Thanks again to them for, for being our partner. And uh, we'll talk to you on the next one. Great. Thanks. Cheers.